Today we're going to be in 1 John again, but we're going to be in chapter 3. Well, really the end of chapter 2 into chapter 3, because even though we do have chapter um, and verse divisions, these, this was just a letter. Um, the sermon is titled, Love and Conformity. Love and Conformity. 1 John, so we're going to start in the end of chapter 2, um, and then going into, of course, the first few verses of chapter 3. Starting in verse 28 of 1 John chapter 2. Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shy or shrink away. And that's, again, this is to give context of the emotional maturity of the church that he's writing to. He's referring to them as children because they are babies in the Lord. They're children in, the, in, in their walk with Jesus Christ, which also is something that is a reminder for us to, to be patient with new Christians. With new Christians, if, if we're ever in a situation where, we're in, where, where we are um, discipling someone or we are counseling someone and they are, uh, they are new to the faith, we have to remember that there's so many things that uh, are new to them and, and that they don't necessarily understand and obviously kind of find that balance between their, their fresh zeal and their joy for, of the Lord that they're experiencing for the very first time in their life and then where they might not necessarily be totally <laughs> biblically accurate uh, and just kind of take both because we have an example here where John, and, and just in the earlier exhortations as well, if you've been listening, uh, listening in or watching on YouTube and, and, and being here on, on Sundays, you know, he writes this letter so that they may not sin. This is a, a, a very, very new church that needs lots of guidance. And you can hear the grace in what it is that John is, is sharing with them as, as addressing them you know, through. This is, again, this is, we put the chapter divisions and the verse divisions in. He's coming back and saying, little children, little children, my children. And so he's just coming to them with this gentleness, especially after kind of laying it down on them in, 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 in uh, chapter two on there, you know, showing the difference between someone who truly knows God and truly doesn't and, and, and pointing not just to their um, declaration of it with their words, but the actions and the deeds of their life. And so he addresses them and says, little children, I want you to abide in him. What an encouragement. What a reminder even for ourselves to abide in him, to make abode with him, to be with him, to be near him. So that when he appears, we have the confidence and we won't shrink away from him in shame. At his coming, and if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is then born of him. So one of the easiest litmus tests of whether or not someone truly knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is, do they have a lifestyle of righteousness? And when we look to their life, the first thing that we see is not the words coming out of their mouth, but again, same thing. The actions of their everyday life is what they are doing, something that points people to Jesus Christ. A righteous lifestyle, one that people can define as separate from the world in many different ways. And then in chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, 3. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, has, has showered over us, the, uh, the NIV says that we would be called children of God, and such we are. And so again, he's never questioning their salvation based on their actions or their deeds. He's allowing for their confession of faith to be the, the primary point in which he will address them, but then encourages, admonishes, and even corrects them into sitting there and, and saying, look, we are called the children of God, and he's, I have full confidence that that's what you are, and that's what we are, that we are the children of God. For this reason, the world does not know us or understand us, is also another translation. Because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. A reference to a transfiguration moment when we are new and made totally new in, in Jesus Christ. We know that we, when he appears, we will be like him. Because... We will see him just as he is. Again, seeing him in the transfigured form, in the perfect, perfect form, a spiritual, spiritual God-man. And everyone who has this hope is fixed upon him, purifies himself just as Jesus Christ is pure. So he takes them in their current situation, accepts, accepts them for exactly where they are at. But then, again, gently directs them to two things. He doesn't just point them to their present. He points them to their future, their eternal future. He says, 
when you're transfigured, and we don't even know exactly what you're going to look like, we don't know exactly what that's going to be, we don't even know what your role will be in the millennial kingdom and eternity, because we're not just sitting there on clouds, eating grapes and drinking heavenly wine, we're doing things in heaven. We're appointed unto work for six days and reserved again that seventh day to worship him. All the same things that we do here today will be will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll translate into heaven, but we're going to have heavenly roles and heavenly callings. And all of those things will be something we do every single day. He says, so we don't know what you're going to be. We don't know exactly what you're going to look like, but we're sure of one thing, what? That you are his children. And so he takes them out of their current situation. He takes them out of their current folly, their current mistakes, and says, I don't doubt that you're the children of God. But what I am going to do is I'm going to steer you in the direction that you need to be by focusing on the fact that I have full confidence that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that we're going to be spending eternity in heaven, but then brings them back towards the end of that, of that uh, a verse in, 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 in verse 3, everyone who has this hope, describing eternity, describing transfiguration, describing perfection, well, while they're here, their eyes are going to be fixed upon him and they will purify themselves because he's pure. So he's, again, he's saying, look, you have to just drop this idea of Gnosticism, the dualism of spirit and body, and you have to purify your body as your spirit has been purified by Jesus Christ. It also is a bit of a nod to how powerful deception can be. Because the fact he has to address it this way and clarify it this much shows that they were likely falling back into the carnalism of just doing whatever it is that they wanted with their body. They likely were going back and engaging in either explicit sex acts or alcoholism or any kind of thing that was being affected by that, that kind of Greek area where Gnosticism was really taking root. And he had to really bring that back in. And he really had to correct that. So we don't know what it is. He doesn't name it. It might have been premarital sex. It might have been like, you know, we also forget that the Greeks are historically um, uh, known for, you know, quite a bit of sexual perversion. And um, <clears throat> obviously there's different areas of that. Athens was worse. Um, Sparta, you know, Obviously, Spartans, um, they, they actually had different, <clears throat> different political um, um, punishments for acting like Athenians. Uh, if you actually go back and look at Greek, Greek history, it's really interesting. They had lots of divisions, lots of, uh, of tribalism. But we know that he was addressing impurities to the body. We also know, just by looking at the whole council of God, the greatest impurity to the body is um, a sexual one according to multiple New Testament scriptures. And so we can really just fill in the blanks and know they were doing something wrong. Gluttony, sexuality, and probably some stuff with their language and their words and, and not being, uh, being a witness of the purity of what Jesus Christ truly is. And so <clears throat> what he's conveying to them is that Jesus Christ in his grace saved us. But the greatest expression that we can return to God is a life of obedience to his Lord, to his word, and to his example. He sits there and he says to them, well, everyone who has a hope, the hope of salvation, that came not to them because of their own works or because of their own power or because of their own will, the grace of God in faith, anyone who knows that, anyone who clings to the hope of knowing we're going to be in a perfect place with Jesus Christ, in perfect relationship with him, so perfect that he'll even give us perfect bodies, all the cracking and popping and all the different things that are done. It's gone. No more sore backs. No more uh, uh, issues with, uh, with uh, allergies. No more issues with walking or getting up or, or all the different things that, that happen as you age. It's all gone. Perfect body, new name, perfect place with Jesus Christ. He says, this hope that you have, he says, may that spur you on to what? Purity. And then he says, not just for the sake of being pure, he points them back to the Savior. And he says, just as Jesus Christ was pure. You have to make yourself pure because he is pure. Turn with me to John chapter 13. What it is, is he's actually defining true spiritual dualism with them. That's what he's doing. He's redefining the false ideas that they had of Gnosticism and said, no, 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 there is a dualism. 
But the dualism is sanctification of your body and adoption of what God has placed and where God has put your spirit. So John chapter 13, the gospel of John chapter 13, verse 35. So the gospel of John chapter 13 and verse 35. It says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If you, what? Have love one for another. And this is going back also to recognize that Jesus Christ expressed his love to sinners before they could, could, could uh, reciprocate that love back. And then he says, once you are saved, the world will not know you for the love of the world. The world will not know you for the acceptance of them. The world will know you because of how you express Christ's love back and forth one to another. How you, as maybe a man and a woman who are in a church setting, respect one another and respect one another's roles, respect one another's bodies. Where a husband and a wife respect one another, love one another, are kind-hearted to one another. The leadership of a husband and a father and a man the beautiful and Christ-like submission of a wife and the women in the church. When we look to what the Bible describes for us and how we are to love, it's clearly defined. So if we aren't doing it that way and we do not express love the way that it's been defined in the scripture, then we're outside of the will of God. We're outside of his perfect discretion and direction that we received already from him in an exhaustive way playbook <laughs> that we call the Bible. It's funny, my kids are, uh, are doing these little quizzes at, uh, at uh, my, fa- my father-in-law's church because we go there in the evening. And so it's all these different little quiz things. How many books are in the Old Testament? 39. How many are in the New Testament? 27. What's the definition of Bible? It's one book containing two covenants. How many authors? 40. How long did it take to to write 1600 years how many authors oh no i said that 40 <laughs> and so it just goes through and has all these different little quiz things how many books in the old testament of of prophecy major prophets minor prophets um, um poetry history and so it's always just so you know it's always 12 and 5 12 and 5 12 and 5 <laughs> and so you always have a 50 percent chance if you ever go to the church in the evening But it's funny because you see the different learning styles of all of my children. They're actually all very, very smart. Um, But but, uh, Eva, is she she takes a little bit of time to always think about what it is that she wants to answer. And so some of her cousins and some of her siblings always have their hands up first. So I said, Eva, just put your hand up. You know the answer. So she she just puts her hand up. And then her her grandfather asks the question and she just sits there. She leans in over to me sometimes and she goes, what did he ask again? (laughs) And so I sit there and say, define the Bible. And I don't know why they do this, but they always do this. Two books containing, oh, no. (laughs) One book containing two covenants. And so we have this pattern that we start creating in their life at a very, very young age to show them what it means to know what they're talking about. And it's funny because we sit here as Christians and we have a guidebook from the word of God. It says, well, this is how people will know that you're a Christian and we'll do everything except what the Bible tells us to do. Show and express the love one to another. We'll have apologetics ready and we'll have an answer ready. And I'm not saying that all of that is right or wrong. That's all right. Yes, for sure. Know what you believe in, why you believe it. Be prepared in in, in any time and in any moment to defend your faith and show people the hope that lies within you. That's all in the Bible. But the first thing the world looks at is how we treat one another. First in marriage, then with our children, and then they look to the church. Because guess what? They don't know how we treat one another in here. They have no idea how I speak to you or how you speak to me, how uh, Sarah prepares the, the, uh, the coffees and the teas and the cookies and, and all of those different things, how we're going to be preparing an outdoor service, how Tim, in his long suffering, stays longer at church than he wants to to help her clean up. <laughs> Which you can kind of tell if, if it starts dragging on, he's kind of antsy and he's kind of walking around and he's kind of looking around because he loves his wife. 
And because even though he would like to leave as soon as church is done after being polite and carrying on with the rest of his Sunday, that he stays to make sure that the part that makes her part of the church and expresses part of her involvement in the church is accomplished. And so they don't see any of that. So what do they see? They see how you talk about other Christians. They see how you talk to and about your wife when she's not around or your husband when he's not around about your children when they're not in earshot about your children's children when they're not around and so they're going to see based on how you speak and how you express yourself in love when they say oh you should come play golf on sunday i'm going to be at church oh i'm going to go do this on on saturday night sorry we have a movie night at church we're going to be watching a christian movie Oh, I'm going to do, and they'll start recognizing oh, these people are doing things differently. And that's just examples from within our own church. There's other churches that have you know, midweek programs and midweek Bible studies and all these other different things. And we can see that Christians are either making it a priority or they are not. And wherever you make priorities, that's where your love truly lies. And so you have to start analyzing your own life and sitting there and saying, okay, well, how do I express God's love to other Christians? To win the souls of the world. Turn with me. Also to Ephesians chapter 5. What's that? Sorry. I said you don't think that I will know. I don't know if that's like the number one thing I'd do. (laughs) (laughs) Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 1 through 13. Ephesians chapter 5. And I think Ephesians 5 really captures... What John is saying here in just a few verses, it basically just kind of brings it out and really gives us a a broader definition of what he's expressing here in 1 John as well. But Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So he's saying, little children, very, very similar address, as children, as beloved children, you must walk in love as Christ also loved us, and he gave his self for you, and so you can live your life as a sacrifice, a living one to God. And he goes on to define what we shouldn't be doing, but immorality of any kind, impurity, greed, must not even be named among you as would be proper among the saints. There must be no filthiness, no silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So what's he saying? He's saying that which you do and spend most of your time doing, either thinking about, obsessing about, planning about, if that's not related to positively impacting your family, your church, or the kingdom of God, it's become an idol. Because he goes on, he says, these immoral things that he names are just symptoms. That's just symptoms. And it's a symptom of what? He told us. This man who's an idolater and in in, 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 doesn't have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So he just defined different ways that people who don't have the proper understanding of who Christ is and what would be expected of them as Christians or as people who know God, maybe they're not Christians yet. He says these, this, this immorality, this impurity, this greed, it shouldn't even be named among you as would be proper among the saints. There should be no filthy talk, no, no silly uh, uh, talk, coarse jesting. It's not fitting for you, but instead be rather, it'd be giving of thanks. For you know the certainty that no more impure person or covetous man has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and defines them as an idolater. Why? Because the world is their idol. What they can gain from the world is their idol. What they can gain from, from, that, from that, uh, that praise from the world, that's really their idol. They're not really making God their point of worship. They're making something else their point of worship. Verse 6, walk in light. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of this, the things of, uh, because of these things, The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. And he's showing a division between how the world will live and how you should live. 
For you were formerly darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk then as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And that's a really, really deep question you can ask yourself. Have I been trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord? Verse 10. Are you actively on your own terms, in your own walk with Jesus Christ, your own relationship with the Savior who gave you the Holy Spirit as a seal for your eternal salvation? Have you learned to try what's pleasing to the Lord? We do it with our wives. We do it with our husbands. We do it with our children. We do it with our grandchildren. Do we do it with God? The one that we should be starting with. There's an active, constant activity within your hearts to sit there and say, is what I'm about to do going to please God? And how will it please God? And if you can't define that, you have to either define it or drop it. Verse 11. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it's disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things will become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything becomes visible in the light. So the light of Jesus Christ should start shining within your own life, and you should be seeing what it is that you're doing wrong. You should be able to analyze and be subjective about your own life when you read the Bible, because the Bible is the light that will shine into your personal life and say, this needs to be rooted out. This needs to go. And this has to stay and this has to grow. So it has to be something that you, as a Christian, have your own personal walk with Jesus Christ, learn to just start weeding into and, and, and as far as things that need to be removed, weeding out. There's a quote here that I have from um, Jerry Bridges. God's ultimate goal for us, however, is that we would be truly conformed to the likeness of his son in our person, as well as in our standing. Those are two very different things. Standing is what the world sees. Person is what God sees. Jesus did not die just to save us from penalty of sin, nor even just to make us holy in our standing before God. He died to purify for himself a people eager to obey him, which is a reference back to 1 John. A people eager to be transformed into his likeness. This process of gradually conforming us to being Christ-like begins at the very moment of our salvation when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us and actually gives us a new life in Jesus Christ. We call this gradual process, progressive sanctification, or growing in holiness, because it truly is a growth process. Or as my American friends tell me, process. They're saying it wrong. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> so then what is love? That's what you have to define, really. What is love as far as my relationship with Jesus Christ? How is that love defined? And the Bible defines it for us. It has to be self-sacrificial. We have to be willing to give things up for the sake of knowing that it's better to serve God than to do those things. And so if you can't make a list of things that you don't do, things that you have given up, knowing that it would lead the world down the wrong path, because it doesn't point them towards God. It points them towards selfishness or points them towards personal development or points them towards something that's separate from the gospel. You have to really start to analyze your own life and sit there and say, okay, if God has defined love as self-sacrificial in which I would be willing to sacrifice things to be a living sacrifice for Jesus Christ because he was a willing personal sacrifice for my sins, that he would be beaten, he would be bludgeoned. They didn't even recognize him, that he would be... Um, uh, martyred on the cross, bleeding out, and then suffocating on the, on, on the tree. I just have to be a living sacrifice. I just have to give up a few little things. Sure, some of it's going to be harder. Absolutely. But that's the point. You don't think it was easy? It was, it was, you don't think it was hard for him to face the cross and to face the separation of himself and his father and the Holy Spirit to be removed because he adopts and, and weighs the whole sin of the entire world, past, present, and future on his shoulders that he can be a proper propitiation of our sins before his father, lawful sacrifice that he can say it is finished on that cross? Of course it was hard. Of course it was difficult. And it's way more difficult than anything you likely will have to go through for the sake of saying that I'm a Christian. 
and I'm a Christ follower. So love is defined already for us by the Bible. We must be living sacrifices, willing to make sacrifices of our personal will or even possessions or even whatever. It doesn't matter. Fill in the blank. That's something for you to analyze and to live a life that glorifies God by showing that love then one to another. My second point is that we have this great expectation, but it doesn't come from man. That expectation comes from God. Just look at verse 4 through 11 of chapter 3 and back in 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And not a reference to someone speeding or breaking a law of man. He's referencing to the laws of God, the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments that don't go away, that are there forever. Not the, not the tittles and not the, the extensions of the, of the Levitical law that now don't apply, but instead bringing us back to the moral law of God, saying there's still a moral baseline in which you will live your life as followers of Jesus Christ. Verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sin. And in him, there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins, and no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Because don't forget, Again, the lies of what they were learning there in, in, from, from the Greek philosophers and the false believers, or even you know, maybe some Greeks that were Christians but you know, couldn't get past their Gnostic beliefs. They were saying, well, no, you can act however you want. It doesn't matter. So you can act righteously and you can act unrighteously. It doesn't matter because that's just your body. Your spirit is made perfect in Jesus Christ. So you, that will never be tainted by what you do with your body. That was the lie that was being told. So he's just saying, look, if someone's doing something that's righteous, they are righteous. So he's taking them from the negative and then bringing them into the positive of it as well. He's saying anyone who practices sinfulness, they're a sinner. They don't really know God if they're content and happy and have no guilt over what it is that they practice. And equally and opposite, true, a man who does righteous things is a righteous man or woman based on the actions of what they are doing. But he's saying the core of it has nothing to do with the action itself. It's found back in what we read in verse 2 and 3. Everyone who has this hope is fixed upon and purifies, and then just as he is, makes himself pure. So he's saying the starting point is Jesus Christ. It's not your actions. The starting point is knowing him in a personal and loving way, not what you do and the deeds that you do, because He offers, if you continue to read on in in, in 1 John, he offers consolation for those that sin and proper context of understanding that he's not speaking in absolutes and that if you have any sin that you're not a Christian, he's just talking about the patterns of their lifestyle and the choices they make every day. He goes on again and says again, verse 7, little children. (laughs) That grace of understanding that they're fresh, they're new Christians, they're still learning. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, and the devil has sinned from the beginning. And that's the, you know, that's the nuance of the words. Practices sin. Practices righteousness, which is what? A pattern of the day-to-day actions and deeds of that person's life. It's something that it can be expressed over a longer period of time and people can define them by what it is that they are doing. It says here that the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. So now he's drawing again that separation between someone who truly knows God and someone who doesn't. He says that Jesus Christ came for the very purpose to destroy what what Satan was doing in the hearts of men since the fall of Adam and Eve. To free them from the choice of sin. Because there was no choice before. It was always just sin. (laughs) So he says, Jesus Christ has come for that very purpose to give you the freedom away and the freedom not to sin. 
He says in verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin because he, what? And then we have that same word, abides in him. So he's near him. He's close to him. In ways he's within him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. And he's using this very, this very dualistic verbiage because he's doing the same thing the Gnostics were doing, but bringing it back to Jesus Christ and bringing it back to a lifestyle of righteousness. By this, he says, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. You just have to look. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Oh, and then he loops it back in. He says, you can look at someone's life and clearly see whether they do know Jesus Christ in the personal loving way. Just look at the daily life. But then he brings it back and says, nor the one who does not love his brother. So now he's taking it from people that you could even look that were outside the church or claim to be of God and aren't based on their actions. But then he holds the church accountable right after. Also, just the one who doesn't love his brother. So he points, he goes from, what people would be looking at outside the church to going right back into the church and holding the church accountable for how they're supposed to be acting. And he says, if you don't show love to one another, he says, it's no different than the people that are actively out there sinning on a regular basis. In verse 11, for this, the message which you have heard from the beginning, you should love one another. So God has a very, very clear expectation on his children. We must act as Jesus Christ did. We must purify ourselves as Jesus Christ did. We must speak, love, live a life that reflects Christ. And that is why we call ourselves Christians. It's funny, I saw a little excerpt from a uh, <clears throat> Jewish comedian. He says, I'm going to start my, I'm going to start my little... Um, I'm going to start my little uh, skit here with a, one joke first. He says there was a, a Jewish, a very, very devout Jewish man. He has this conversation with his son. His son comes to him and says, Dad, I've converted to Christianity. And he goes, Oy vey! <laughs> he says, I can't believe it, my son. No, you can't convert to Christianity. So he goes to the rabbi. And he says, Rabbi, you would not believe him, my son. I've raised him in the Torah. I raised him in the Talmud. And he runs away and he became a Christian. He says, oh, my brother. He says, my son did the exact same thing. We must come together and we must pray to God. We must pray to the Father God and tell him what has happened. So they get together and they say, God, <laughs> our sons... They, we raised them in your covenant and we raised them in all of the things that you understand. And they have left and they've become Christians. And God answers them and says, well, I have a story to tell you too. He said, I raised my son in all of the covenants and I sent him to earth and he became a Christian. <laughs> because obviously Christ's follower is Christian. Anyways, it was, I thought that was pretty funny because it's a Jewish comedian acknowledging what God has said in his Old Testament to the New Testament points them towards Jesus Christ. So we have to be able to show people that we are followers of Christ. That what we say we believe in is not just lip service, but instead it's life service of what it is we need to do on a daily basis. And again, even though he talks about sin, and even though he talks about looking to people's missteps, or consistent unrighteous walks and inconsistent unrighteous living. With every moment that he points them towards sinfulness, he brings it back to holding the church accountable for the love of one another, for how you love one another. Oh, and just as all these people are acting in all these evil ways that don't actually show Christ's love, well, the church does the exact same thing by just not loving one another. I want you to turn with me to Romans 7. I love Romans 7. Romans 7 is just a real kick in the teeth a lot of times. <laughs> it is. It's like, <clears throat> it's like getting spanked and then hugged, just the way you should be. 
<laughs> I remember my mom would come to me and she'd say, I'm going to spank you, but it's because I love you. And I'm like, no! <laughs> don't spank me! If you, don't, if you love me, you won't spank me! Anyways. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Or don't you know, brethren, I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he would live. For this married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she's now released from the law, referring to Old Testament Levitical law. So then, if while her husband is living and joined with another man, she's called an adulteress, but if the husband dies and free from that law, she's then now not an adulteress, though she's joined with another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die in the law through the body of Jesus Christ. So he's saying the law is not dead. The law is actually alive, but it's fulfilled now in Jesus Christ. So that you might be joined to another, to him, capital H, God, who was raised from the dead, speaking, obviously referring to directly to Jesus Christ, in order that we might bear the fruit of God. Oh, that's interesting. That reminds me of another passage of scripture that says, anyone who goes to a fig tree looking for grapes or goes to a grape tree looking for figs, he says, no, that's not, like, that, that's not the case. Because you wouldn't expect that. You would expect to find grapes on a grapevine and figs on a fig tree. For while we were in the flesh, sinful passions, while we were aroused by the law, it was we were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we've been released from the law, having died, so that by which we were bound, so that now we serve in newness and spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Not a reference to the moral law of God, but a reference to the Levitical law of God. And then, for the sake of time, What shall we say then is the law sin? Verse 7, may it never be. On the contrary, or God forbid, the King James says, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. It's not the law. The law is not the problem. The law is not your enemy. I would have not known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, taking the opportunity through the commandment, produced in me a coveting of, kind, of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but while the commandment came, sin alive and then died. And this commandment, which was the result of life, proved the result in death for myself. Why? Because he didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit yet. Because he didn't have the power of Christ yet. The acknowledgement of sin and the description of sin from the Old Testament condemned us. For sin taking the opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it then killed me. So then the law is holy, but the commandment is holy righteousness and good oh it's just me that's the problem <laughs> but really it's sin in me <clears throat> verse 14 for we know the law is spiritual but i am of the flesh sold into the bondage of sin for what i am doing i do not understand for i am not practicing that which i would like to do but i am doing the very thing that i would hate but if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I agree with the law, confessing the law would be good. So no, no longer am I the one doing the sin. Or sorry, no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. Oh, the spiritual dualism that John is referring to as the little children in 1 John. There's true spiritual dualism, a recognition of a separation of spirit and man, but one that is bound by the law and the power and salvation of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. Oh, okay, there's your dualism again. That is in my flesh. Oh, wait a second. For the willingness is present within me. The doing of the good is not referring to just his flesh. For the good that I want, I do not, but I practice the very evil I don't want to do. But if I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do, I'm no longer the one doing it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a principle. Evil is present within me. The one who wants to do good. For I joyfully agree with the law of God in the inner man. Ooh. 
but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? And he gives us the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that on one hand I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh the law of sin. And both glorify God. Because the law of sin, which we do sometimes obey, the imperfection of our lifestyle and everything that we do on a daily basis screams to our spirit that we need Christ. And simultaneously, Christ is in our spirit saying, it is finished. What Romans 7 is going to express to us is that our Christian walk at the very least is going to be a battle. Right till we die. <laughs> you know, if maybe you were blind and deaf and mute, you'd sin less. <laughs> you can only sin with the, with the fabric of the imagination of your mind. <laughs> and you'd still need Jesus. You'd still need God. But at the very least, you're going to have a battle until your life is over. So what do we find then back in 1 John? 1 John verse 13, sorry, 11 to 24. We find that there's this outward evidence, and this is my third and final point, my outward evidence of God's love in my life. Verse 12, sorry, verse 12 to 24. Not as Cain, who was one of the evil one and slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil. His brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Oh, so there's another thing that you can recognize. Does the world hate you for what you believe? Truly, does the world, the people that you also are simultaneously witnessing to, do they hate you for what they believe? They should. It's not to say that they can't not necessarily have a conversation with you. Absolutely. We have salvation by having conversations. But down deep in their core, there's something about you they should absolutely hate because they're the world now of course you have degrees of salvation and i don't mean that you are partially saved but the holy spirit is working on the hearts and the minds of people actively as you speak to them so there's a softness sometimes an acceptance a tolerance as well even an interest in the gospel as they get closer and closer to the time in which god seals them for his eternity but they should based on what you believe, hate something about your life because you are the antithesis to everything that they hold dear and near in their life. We know, verse 14, that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brethren. Man, he's just hammering on this, is he not? How many times is that now? In one letter, six, seven times. He who does not love abides in death. Hmm, so we have to balance this as well. We have to show love, first and foremost, to our brethren. But we also, in, simultaneously, have to understand that that expression of love to other Christians is showing the world whether we are alive or whether we are dead spiritually. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know, and again, practices, not just one shot, because God even authorizes a murder all through the Old Testament, even parts of the New Testament. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. We ought then, what? Lay down our lives for the brethren. Have a willingness to die for one another. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed. This is also an, a, a very, very revealing verse, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, that goes to show you that it's not a sin to benefit off of the constructs of society for money. It's to make sure it's not your idol. 
because he's actually holding other Christians who have accountable against the Christians who don't. And he's saying, if you have money, the best place you can put it is in the pocket of a brother or a sister in need. The second best place, the orphans and the widows. And we see that through all of Scripture. A wonderful reference of that too, if you want to, you don't have to turn with me. If you're quick, you will. I just want to I want to wrap it up here so I don't want to make you go everywhere. But James 2.14 says, What use is this, my brethren, if someone says that you have faith but have no works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing yet you and, and need of daily food, and yet one of you says to them, I'll go in peace and be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Someone may say to you, well, I have faith. And I have works. Show me your faith without the works. I will show you my faith with my works. Believe that God is one, and you do well. The demons even believe and shudder. He's saying, you're no better than the demons. They say they believe in God too. He's saying there has to be both here. You can't just sit there and say, I have faith, and not showing that faith expressed for the brethren. And going back to 1 John chapter 3 closes his heart against him, then how does the love of God abide in him when you're not providing for the needs of your own people, your own brothers and your own sisters? Little children, let us not love the word with just our tongues, but in our actions, our deeds, and in truth, verse 18. Verse 19 says, we will know by this that we are of the truth and we assure within our hearts before him. In whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So don't just rely on what your heart is saying. Don't just feel bad and feel guilty for what it is you're doing and stop there. Don't listen to your heart because he's saying what? The same thing that he says previously. Above all things, your heart is deceptive and, or no, deceitful and deceptively wicked. Don't trust your heart. Forget it. Trust his word. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, We have confidence before God. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. And we do the things that are pleasing in his sight. For this this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of Jesus, sorry, believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Wow, hammered it again. Eighth or ninth time. Just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he christ in that man or woman and we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us as what we read here and then also that reference of james chapter 2 14 love is simply self-sacrifice If anything else, summed up in one quick definition, love is self-sacrifice. We're willing to sacrifice the things that we would want, desire, or do to show love to one another. That's what it is. It's caught up in one nice little statement. We'll close with John chapter 21. The Gospel of John. John 21, verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, John, sorry, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you 
and bring you where you do not wish to go. He said these things signifying of what end in death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And what did Jesus Christ do? He laid down his life as a personal sacrifice for people. And specifically in reference here to Peter, who couldn't even say they knew him when it really mattered most. He denied him three times before the rooster crowed. So he's restoring him here. But he restores him to say what? Focus on the church, Peter. Focus on tending my lambs, tending my sheep, being the shepherd, the little rock, the Petra. May you be one of the leaders of this church when I am gone. And I need you to follow me. And self-sacrificial love. And of course, was so renewed in the spirit of God that he was put on a cross to be crucified just as his savior. And he said, don't even associate me with the glory and the power and the perfection of him. You must hang me upside down. Please pray with me. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the time that we've shared together in reading of what it is that Jesus Christ has expressed to us in the word. May we hold to it tightly in what it is that God has for us. May we analyze our own life and sit there and say, what has become an idol? What has stopped me? What has prevented me from being able to show Jesus Christ to the world and to one another, other Christians, fellow brothers and sisters of the Lord? And may we also first start at home, our husbands, our wives, our children. How can I properly, properly show Christ's love, show Christ's authority, show Christ's abundance in their life? And help us, Father, to make the hard decisions that are much easier still than what you had to face upon that cross and the separation that you had from your Father. May we, Father, continue to remind ourselves of that so we can be glorified in obedience, submission, and alignment and conformity to your will and your power and your powerful example in Jesus' name. Amen.